right, thanks Anthony and welcome back. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be here to talk a little bit about sports concussion. It's a, sports concussion is such a hot topic. It's an exciting part of sports medicine. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is an area of sports uh, concussion management that I think is really evolving quickly. I have no disclosures. This is our team. This is our sports concussion team. So we're a group of sports medicine physicians, athletic trainers, physical therapists, neuropsychologists, uh, all working together to take care of both acute and chronic uh, sports concussion injuries. And so what uh, I hope you gain from the next uh, 30 minutes is the, these following take home points. So first, in concussion these days, it's actually that less rest is best. For a long time, we've talked about rest, 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 and that is really changing, and I'll talk to you in detail about that. Secondly, we're gonna talk about identifying and treating different concussion phenotypes. We'll talk about gradual return to work or learn accommodations, return to physical activity with accommodations or rehab, and then when people are ready for full contact play. So that we're on the same page, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page with this definition. So what's a concussion? A concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury caused by a blow to the head, neck, or body, and importantly, symptoms should manifest within 48 hours. Our standard neuroimaging in concussion is normal, and concussion may or may not include loss of consciousness. And a concussion, the symptoms that a person exhibits from a concussion should not be explained by some other thing like drugs or alcohol, medication use, or some other injury. So let's talk about rest. For a long time, we have recommended rest for concussion. And why have we recommended rest? We've recommended rest because we know that concussion is an energy crisis. We know that when a person is concussed, their brain needs more energy to recover. And so rest has always seemed like the right medicine. Also, animal studies have shown that starting physical activity right after a traumatic brain injury delays cognitive recovery. We've seen in kids who return to school early after a concussion, they take longer to get better. And cognitive rest after an injury has shown to lead to faster recovery times. So there's this whole body of literature about why we have always recommended rest for concussion. And then we started to recommend not only just relative rest, but we started to recommend, some of us, resting until you're 100% better. So resting until symptom-free, which is a little different from relative rest. So where did that idea come from? Why did we start to say rest until you're symptom-free? Well, it really came from sports literature. So there's evidence in sports literature that if you go back to play when you're still symptomatic, the outcome can be catastrophic. So there are case reports that patients have died when they go back to play still with concussion symptoms. And so that has led us to be extremely conservative. There's data around football players who go back to play within seven to 10 days of their initial injury and they get reconcussed. And so there's concern about, again, going back when you're still symptomatic or in this window that's very close to the initial injury. And so this body of literature around rest, and furthermore, resting until you're 100% better, was actually translated into an expert consensus paper in 2012 saying, yeah, we suggest that people rest until they're asymptomatic and then go back to learn and back to play. But lately, so the pendulum is swinging. So it's been shown now that too much rest may be harmful after a concussion. So one study on kids age 11 to 22 showed that those who rested for two days, this is strict rest, basically doing nothing, compared to those who had strict rest for five days, the kids who rested for five days actually did worse. So at three weeks, they actually had more symptoms than the kids who only rested for two days. And it's been shown now that exercise given after a rest period actually can expedite recovery. And furthermore, that removing a child from school for an extended time may cause anxiety about returning to school. 
And so the most recent consensus paper on concussion said this about rest. This is, uh, I thought I would read it because I, I think they, uh, it's very aptly written. So there is currently insufficient evidence that prescribing complete rest achieves the objectives, those of mitigating symptoms and or promoting recovery by minimizing brain energy demands post-concussion. So they recommend after a brief period of rest, 24 to 48 hours after injury, patients can be encouraged to become gradually and progressively more active while staying below their cognitive and physical symptom exacerbation thresholds. The exact amount and duration of rest is not yet well defined and requires further study. Okay. But this is a real change. I think to me, this really signaled a change in how we manage concussion. Because now the recommendation is rest for a couple days. And so then the thing is, well, then what do you do, right? So you recommend rest, which really is most people feel like they really need to sleep longer. They really need to rest after one of these injuries. Uh, but then after a couple days, people start to feel like they might be able to do a bit more. And, and what do we recommend when we see them in the office? So this is this idea of active recovery which is where we are now in 2018. So it's a gradual progression back to regular activity as tolerated. And many of us are using this two-point rule, which I will say is completely anecdotal and not evidence-based, but a lot of us in the concussion world are starting to do this, where we explain to a patient, hey, if your headache is a three out of 10, I want you to start taking a walk, doing some emails, socializing. If your headache goes up by two points or more, then that's too much and you back off. So it's just sort of this common sense, listen to your body type of recommendation that we're using. And your history and your physical exam can really help you uh, prognosticate with the patient and then form an individualized recovery plan. And I'm gonna talk to you about how that would look. So let's talk about a case. This is uh, one of my patients. She's a 27 year old software engineer who came in with concussion. She said five days ago she fell while she was skiing. She was helmeted. She had no loss of consciousness but had immediate headache. Her friends took her to a local emergency department. They did a neurological exam. No head CT was needed. She was advised to rest and to follow up the following week in primary care. She, when she comes in to see me, had not returned to work or exercise because she was given a recommendation to rest. She presented with a mild to moderate headache that was worse with bright light and with using a computer and screens, and she felt foggy and tired. She was taking no medications. She had no past medical history, including no history of concussion, headache, ADHD, or psych history. And those things are helpful, as you probably know, to tease out. So we know that concussion really unroofs previously well-controlled kind of simmering issues that people have. So you may have had well-controlled anxiety, you get a concussion and all of a sudden your anxiety is not well-controlled. Or you had uh, maybe a tendency to sleep poorly and then you get a concussion and all of a sudden you can't sleep at all. So uh, highlighting these things or drawing these things out, of, out from your patient can help you uh, prognosticate and help predict how they're gonna fare as they recover. For her, her social history, so she, uh, she's, you know, she works, but her work is really understanding of her injury, and that's super helpful, obviously. Having a ton of stress about work or school will hold people back and make them more stressed through their recovery. All right, so then you turn to a physical exam, and the first part of a concussion physical exam really is to rule out some more severe injury. So to make sure you don't need some imaging, so rule out a head bleed, rule out a C-spine injury. And then when I'm sure it's a concussion, I'm really looking at uh, the symptoms and sort of which systems are affected. And we'll talk about how that looks. So these are the systems. In the past, I've, uh, I've thought about concussion uh, slightly differently in terms of systems. But this is sort of the newer way uh, some of us are starting to think about concussion symptoms, which is in these four spheres. Uh, there's the autonomic sphere. Obviously, the autonomic nervous system controls uh, how we operate, and that can affect, if it's disrupted, your vision, your hearing, your blood pressure, your sleep. There's the vestibulo-ocular system, so how our 
eyes connect to our balance, and uh, that can affect also our feeling of focus or fogginess. There's the cognitive sphere, so your attention, your memory, your ability to do abstract reasoning, and then the emotional sphere, of course, anxiety and depression. And so this, these sort of symptoms, uh, systems is a way to think about uh, the symptoms of concussion. So this is what this patient uh, circled on our intake form. We have all of our patients uh, do the SCAT-5, and part of the SCAT-5 is this validated symptom scale. So it's 22 items with a six, uh, zero to six Likert scale. And so um, I apologize, this is small but and kind of blurry, but um, what it looks like on here is that She's got a three out of six headache and pressure in her head. She has sensitivity to light. She doesn't feel right, four out of six. And then she also is saying that she's uh, more emotional, four out of six, sad and anxious, all four out of six. So just eyeballing this, you know, she's, she's definitely clustering in this kind of headachey area and in this emotional area. And we can start to think about, well, what do those systems mean as far as what systems are affected in her body? So how do those map, maybe, to how what's been injured? What's her concussion phenotype look like? So headache is super nonspecific, unfortunately, <laughs> and could indicate, as you would think, it could indicate an eye problem. It could indicate an autonomic nervous system problem. It could indicate a cognitive problem, so not super specific. Emotional, obviously, um, I think is somewhat specific, but could be secondary to having headaches or not being able to focus. So these things are all interrelated. But using those symptoms, you know, I think I'm less concerned because I looked at her systems in that, in that way. I'm less concerned about her having a real cognitive issue because she's not reporting confusion. She's not reporting a ton of fogginess. And I'm a little less concerned about her vestibulo-ocular system because she's not reporting vertigo and dizziness and things like that. So that's sort of how, how we start to think about where we're going to focus in. And then carrying on in your physical exam can further bring you to identify the phenotype of this concussion. So does she have orthostatic vital signs? Does she have an elevated resting heart rate? Does she have large but reactive pupils? Those would all be signals that her autonomic nervous system is disrupted. What about her eyes? So does she have eye tracking problems? Does she have balance problems? And a little bit more on this screening. So um, just by show of hands, does anyone do vestibular ocular motor screening in your clinic when you see a patient with concussion? A couple. So I think that this isn't commonly done, and I've just brought in a couple exam maneuvers to kind of introduce you to this idea to see if you might find it helpful in uh, giving your patients recommendations. Because if patients have vestibulo-ocular dysfunction after a concussion, they actually can benefit from physical therapy for vestibular rehab. And these are some pretty straightforward tools. So we're going to spend a teeny bit of time now, but Dr. Chang and Hallie Tappan, one of our athletic trainers, will have a whole hour on this tomorrow afternoon when they do the concussion physical exam workshop. So how are these helpful? Well, if a patient has symptoms with horizontal saccades, and I'll show you how we look at that, if they have symptoms with horizontal saccades, that horizontal eye motion is crucial when you're reading and crucial for visual processing of text. And so that's going to play right into their difficulties with school or work. If they have trouble with vertical saccades, so looking up, down, what you're doing right now, looking up here, then down to your paper, to your screen, that's using your, your smooth vertical saccades. And if you have trouble with that, you can imagine it would be very difficult to be at work or in a crowd uh, or at school trying to focus on the board and focusing on your notes. And so you can give accommodations to your student athlete if you notice that they have symptoms with vertical saccades. Lastly, near point convergence is just our ability to see things as they approach the tip of our nose. And sometimes in concussion that's disrupted. And that too is crucial in transitioning from far vision to near vision. And so here's what these things look like. So this is uh, Dr. Chang and Gina Biviano demonstrating horizontal saccades. And you can see Gina's eyes going back and forth, back and forth very smoothly. If she had symptoms with this after her concussion, you, that would be a tip off that her horizontal uh, vestibular ocular motion is disrupted. 
just the opposite on vertical saccades. What we do is we ask the patient to rate their symptoms ahead of time and then after one of these exercises, and then you get a sense of um, how much each exercise bothers them. So that's vertical saccades. And then near point conversions, we use a tongue depressor with an X on it and hold it out and bring it gradually to closer and closer to the tip of the patient's nose. And when they see two X's, sometimes you'll even see one of their eyes deviate out when those, that happens. That's uh, the point at which their near point convergence uh, ends. Uh, and you measure from the tip of their nose. Different people use different amounts for abnormal. Uh, you can use 10 centimeters. Uh, some people say in adolescence it should be six centimeters. So anything greater than 10 centimeters. So if I can't focus 20 centimeters out, that would be an abnormal near point convergence. And that could help inform your return to work or school accommodations. And then the other thing we look at really carefully in concussion is balance. Uh, this helps inform us Honestly, this, this uh, resolves quite quickly, actually, after a concussion. Most student athletes, their balance abnormalities actually normalize within five days post-injury. Uh, but I like to look at this right when I see them because I want to know how that student athlete's balance is post-injury, and then I want to check it again before I clear them to go back to play. And so this is a picture of the balance error scoring system, which is in your handout. We use the top three stances just on the floor because it's quick, and the student athlete stands in each of those for 20 seconds. I put in your syllabus the details about how to score this and some norms for adults and kids. But essentially, you have them stand in each stance for 20 seconds, eyes closed, and then you basically grade how many times they open their eyes or sway and become unbalanced. So getting to treatment, so how do these things help, uh, help us create this sort of active recovery prescription after the student athlete or patient has rested? So if their autonomic system is disrupted, what do they need to do? Well, they need to start getting active. It turns out that the best treatment for these patients with a bit of autonomic dysfunction post-concussion is actually gradually returning to school and work, but with some decreased stimuli. So wearing sunglasses if the light's really bothersome, using earplugs if noise is really bothersome. And then allowing actually light aerobic activity. This is even if they're symptomatic. They can do light aerobic activity, remembering that two-point rule. So we gradually have them do a bit of cardiovascular activity as long as they're not feeling worse and gradually increase as they can. How would you approach them if you find abnormalities on their vestibular ocular exam? So if they have a vertical saccade problem, so that problem looking up, down, up, down, you might suggest that they avoid note taking and use pre-printed notes at school. If they have trouble with horizontal saccades, so reading text, you might suggest larger font audiobooks. If there's a convergence deficit, again, larger font audio lectures, and then these patients, if there's a resource, can benefit from vestibular PT. Cognitive problems. So the majority of the subtle cognitive problems that these concussion patients recognize post-injury will resolve gradually as they return to work or school. And so what we do is we want to encourage them to return, even though they have some symptoms, and use the two-point rule to modulate. And what about emotional symptoms? So emotional symptoms um, you know, can be apparent when you do that symptom inventory right at the beginning. I will sometimes with my adult patients use the PHQ-9 or the GAD-7 uh, if I really feel like they, uh, their symptoms are clustering in the emotional sphere and I want to put a finer point on it. And then I'll track that over time. It's been shown, uh, research has shown that concussion patients benefit tremendously by reassurance. And so knowing that the majority of patients with concussion recover, the majority of adults recover within 14 days, and the majority of young people recover within four weeks, and to reassure people that they will recover and you expect them to recover 100% uh, can be incredibly helpful for these patients and their mood. And it sounds kind of funny, but I, I usually ask patients, I say, well, tell me, like, have you been worrying that you might not get better from this? And they, I haven't had a patient yet tell me no. 
So every patient worries. I think it's just because there's been a lot of attention around concussion and the long-term uh, problems around head injury. Uh, almost every, every patient I ask has said, I'm really worried that I'm never going to get better. And this could be young kids. This is older adults. These are people who've just had one concussion uh, within a week post-injury. They're really worried they're not going to get better. So really reassuring them that I'm 100% I'm sure you're going to make a full recovery because that is what the data says, that these people get better, and they actually get better quite quickly. So providing them reassurance and a clear plan for how they're going to return to school and work and um, empathy can be helpful for this. So returning to our patients. So again, she's 27 years old. She's five days after a fall while skiing. She has a concussion. She's a software engineer, and she's been off work since injury. We looked at her symptoms. I would put, say they're moderately high. She has a total of 46 symptoms. Clustering in headache, light sensitivity, and mood. Her vital signs are normal. Her neck and neuro exam are normal. And her, her, uh, head her headache and head pressure are increased with horizontal and vertical saccades. And her near point convergence is normal. It's less than 10. So a little bit of vestibulo-ocular dysfunction. All right, so how would you treat this patient? So this is an audience response question. Um, would you A, order an urgent head CT to rule out a subtle post-traumatic bleed and ask her to return to clinic after the CT? B, order a brain MRI to evaluate for post-traumatic microhemorrhage and return to clinic after MRI? C, give advice on gradual return to cognitive and physical activity now, no contact sports, follow up in a week? D, rest from cognitive and physical activity until symptom-free and follow up in a week? All right, I agree, yes. So the plan would be she does have symptoms. Her symptoms are moderately high. You've examined her and found that she has some vestibular ocular dysfunction. So you can give her some very specific ideas about uh, larger font, about audio, participating in meetings, but perhaps less reading. These kinds of things can be helpful for her. Um, and she can return using that two-point rule or some kind of other tool to modulate her activities. I would also say she, she could, at this point, start some low-intensity aerobic activity. That would be fine, and that's been shown to be safe. Again, as long as it does not exacerbate her symptoms. This is the kind of stair-stepping return to learn and work progression we use. It's basically, you know, if you have someone where they're not quite sure how to get back into, act, into activity, uh, cognitive activity, basically I tell them, set a timer. Do email or whatever it is for 15 minutes. Timer goes off. How do you feel? If you feel fine, next time do 30 minutes. Then inch up from there. Uh, and that's how we sort of counsel people and kids too. Just kind of as long as they can do an hour or two of stuff at home, then they can go back to school. All right. Um, briefly, I wanted to, uh, I'm not going to present this second case. I just want to highlight that though we are, um, Though we are recommending returning to cognitive and physical activity with symptoms, this does not change the recommendation around return to play. So there's an important distinction when you're returning someone to a sport where they could get another concussion or to an activity. We still recommend they should not return to anything where they're going to hit their head until they are 100% better. So that does not change. So we still follow a gradual return to play progression. This in California must be by law at least seven days. And student athletes must be 100% better asymptomatic on no medications before they return to play. I put in your handout uh, full-size uh, copies of the California Interscholastic Federation handouts for return to learn and return to play in case those are useful for you in your practice. You can also find those online, just Google CIF concussion. And so just to emphasize again, when can our student athlete return to play? So she can return to play after she's done a gradual return to play protocol, she has no concussion symptoms, then she's clear for contact practice in sports. All right, so take home points. So we've talked this morning about the 
concept of active recovery for concussions. So less rest is best, identify and treat the concussion phenotype, use a gradual return to learn or work plan and give some accommodations to your patients. They can also gradually return to some physical activity and remember the two point rule, uh, but they should not return to any contact play or game play until they're 100% asymptomatic. Uh, there are some resources for you in the syllabus. We're always happy to hear from you. Our email uh, at our concussion program is concussion at ucsf.edu. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take a couple questions.